story about his brother as the president now declares an opioid emergency. The hunt for a serial killer, the new videos just released, and the one thing, what could be a major clue tonight. The deadly plot, the high school teens, and the explosive, what they were allegedly about to do. We have breaking news on Harvey Weinstein, what he did just today, and the Diane Sawyer exclusive tonight. Ashley Judd, the first to come forward, now more than 65 women. Judd describing what happened and her message tonight to Weinstein. And their final duet. What Dolly Parton said to Kenny Rogers as he reveals his retirement. This is ABC World News Tonight with David Muir. Good evening, and it's great to have you with us here on a Thursday night, and we begin with that headline just a short time ago, those top-secret JFK files, the president tweeting they were coming today, the final batch of classified documents from the assassination of President Kennedy. A short time ago, the White House now explaining why we've seen nothing so far. Teams of historians and reporters waiting all day long to learn more about that fateful day, including what more did the CIA possibly know about Lee Harvey Oswald before the assassination? his trip to Mexico, his visits to the embassies of Russia and Cuba. Tonight, new concern that releasing some of that material could pose a national security threat. ABC's chief national correspondent, Tom Yamas, leading us off from Washington. Tonight, more confusion and drama surrounding the assassination of JFK. President Trump announcing some of the secret documents scheduled to be released today will not be because they pose a danger to national security. 2,800 other documents are being released to shed more light into the killing. As Mrs. Kennedy. On November 22nd, 1963, President Kennedy and the First Lady arriving in Dallas on that day that would change America. That tragic trip through Dealey Plaza. The first couple riding through that windy road in Dallas in a Lincoln Continental with the top down. The president, an open target for assassin Lee Harvey Oswald. President Kennedy has been shot in Dallas, Texas. From the get-go, the news was so hard to believe. A single man with a rifle killing the protected leader of the free world. Then, just two days later, on live television. There is Lee Oswald. He's been shot. The man who pulled the trigger shot and killed himself in the custody of police officers. All of this sparking intrigue and doubt. Assassins need payrolls, schedules, times, orders. This was a military style ambush from start to finish. This was a coup d'etat with Lyndon Johnson waiting in the wings. The film JFK and its fictional plot surrounding a conspiracy to kill Kennedy fueling even more speculation and in part leading Congress to pass a law to release all federal assassination records by today. Experts say some of those secret documents concern Oswald and his trip to Mexico City seven weeks before the killing, his visits to the Russian embassy and Cuban consulate there, and possibly what the CIA and FBI knew about his intentions to want to kill the president. And everyone will be mining the documents for any clues to the big question, did Oswald act alone? I would like to think uh, that these documents would be a final answer where Americans could look at this case and say, okay, this is what happened. But realistically, that's never going to happen. And the wait continues. Tom Yamas, one of those reporters waiting all day. He's live tonight at the National Archives. And Tom, we are expecting some of those files still tonight. That's right, David. About 2,800 files will be released tonight. The delay on those other files, it was because President Trump felt they were a threat to national security if they were to be released, but they're going to be re-examined. David, the most amazing part about today, Congress initiated this act so it would all come out in the clear for the public. With this move today, this is now going to add more fuel to all those conspiracy theories. It certainly David? will. Tom Yamas leading us off tonight. Tom, thank you. Meantime, President Trump declaring war on the nation's opioid crisis today and offering a a very personal story about his brother and his battle with addiction. But the president was careful with his words, calling it a, quote, public health emergency, and why the words he chose could determine how much money the government will spend to fight this. ABC senior White House correspondent Cecilia Vega tonight. With the stroke of a pen today, President Trump declared the opioid epidemic the worst drug crisis in American history. I am directing all executive agencies to use every appropriate emergency authority to fight 
the opioid crisis. The declaration means patients in rural areas can reach doctors and obtain prescriptions to treat addiction by phone or internet. Unemployed workers who lost their jobs because of addiction will receive job training and assistance, and it lifts bureaucratic red tape, allowing more funding for treatment centers in all 50 states. But the president stopped short of declaring a sweeping national emergency, something he has repeatedly promised. It's a national emergency. We're going to spend a lot of time, a lot of effort, and a lot of money. Today, he said something slightly different, calling it a public health emergency. That means his action does not include emergency federal money to address the crisis that kills nearly 100 people a day. For more than a year, ABC News followed families battling the effects of addiction. In New Hampshire, David sat down with Rory Smith, who found his son Aaron in their basement overdosed. He was gray. I yelled for the phone to call 911, and I proceeded to give him mouth to mouth. He was not breathing, and I couldn't feel a heartbeat. Can you tell me what that's like? It's probably the worst thing I've ever had to do. <clears throat> in my life it was giving him mouth to mouth. I, I, I just, I says, is this how it's all going to end right here in my basement? That time they were able to revive Aaron, but after another overdose, he died. At his funeral, Carrie Norton, a nurse and advocate who tried to help Aaron, made this promise to his grieving father. I'm so sorry. I will fight for him, I promise you. Late today, Kerry told us the problem in New Hampshire has only gotten worse. People desperate for treatment, often having to wait weeks. Now, from President Trump, a familiar call to action targeting young people with a just say no style ad campaign. If we can teach young people and people generally not to start, it's really, really easy not to take them. The president said his own wake up call came from his older brother, Fred. Great guy, best looking guy, best personality, much better than mine. <laughs> but he had a problem. He had a problem with alcohol. And he would tell me, don't drink, don't drink. But he would say it over and over and over again. And to this day, I've never had a drink. And Cecilia Vega joining us from the White House. And Cecilia, it was deeply personal, the president's story. But the White House is still facing tough questions tonight about whether the president's action today is an adequate response for a crisis of this magnitude. David, this comes at a time when the health secretary here was fired for questions over his use of private jets. The drugs are recently resigned. No replacement has been named. And tonight, Democrats are sounding the alarm about funding. Nancy Pelosi today said, show me the money. But David, as you know, the president right there in that story called this a winnable war. And of course, you check back in with those families and will continue to do so on this opioid crisis. Cecilia, thank you. We turn next here tonight to fast moving developments in the search for a possible serial killer in Tampa. Three murders in 10 days and tonight right here, new surveillance of that person of interest. One showing him running away from the direction of the first murder. And in another video, a possible major clue. ABC's Victor Akendo again tonight from Florida. It's the new surveillance video just released by Tampa police showing a person of interest sprinting away from the scene of the first of three murders. We believe that this person has ties to this neighborhood. Also tonight, new angles of that same person walking toward the spot where moments later, 22 year old Benjamin Mitchell was gunned down. Within 10 days, two more victims would be shot to death within a half mile. Police going frame by frame, pointing out one clue. The mystery man appears to be flipping his cell phone. Is that a habit? Does someone know a friend that, that I see them do that all the time? Moments after the shooting, that same man now running away from the direction of the crime scene. The police chief today saying he's come up with four reasons he might be running. One, they may be late for dinner. Two, they're out exercising. Three, they heard gunshots. And number four, they just murdered Benjamin Mitchell. And Victor Akenda was with us live tonight from Florida. And Victor, the police this evening urging the public to look closely at these new videos out tonight. David, police want the public to study every detail from the way this person walks to the way they dress, even the flip of that phone. They're hoping someone recognizes something familiar that can help crack this case. David.
Victor, our thanks to you again tonight. And we move on this evening to the discovery, the homemade explosive and the alleged high school plot foiled. Two teenagers accused of planning a deadly attack with very specific targets, fellow students and teachers. And here's ABC's Steve Osinsami from Georgia tonight. These two 17 year olds seen here at their first court appearances in Georgia are accused tonight of attempted murder in a plot to blow up their school. Do you roughly understand the charges that you've been brought against you? Yeah. Police say that Alfred Dupree and Victoria McCurley had made up a list of teachers and students they were planning to target with explosives at Etowah High School in the North Atlanta suburbs. This would have been a Columbine type incident. The real hero, in, in my opinion, is the person that made the, uh, the initial call and the tip. Investigators say a helpful tip led them to his personal diary spelling out their plans. They also say they found a homemade explosive in her home. I just couldn't believe it. It was, I knew both of those kids. They both rode my bus. On McCurley's social media pages are signs there may have been an issue. Images celebrating the Columbine high school killers. Another picture of Columbine killer Dylan Klebold with the message, outrun my gun. Police believe that mental health issues may be responsible here. And they're not revealing tonight who called this in. David? Steve Osinsami with us tonight. Steve, thank you. Next this evening to a new development in the Harvey Weinstein case. Today he sued his former company for records as he now prepares to defend himself. It comes as Diane Sawyer sits down with Ashley Judd, her first television interview. Judd was the first to come forward about Weinstein. More than 60 other women have now followed. And this evening, Judd with her message for Weinstein now. It surprised us when we heard it. And tonight the message is to Diane from women all over this country. She's a girl from Kentucky. She has also written about the sexual abuse she endured in her young life before she went to California just wanting to be an actor. Towering producer Harvey Weinstein called. I remember the lurch when I went to the desk and I said, uh, Mr. Weinstein, is he on the patio? And they said he's in his room. And I was like, Ugh, are you kidding me? But you went up because? I had a business appointment which is as that's, you know, his pattern of sexual predation. That was how he rolled. We've heard a pattern in the allegations from other women asking to give her a massage, asking for her to give him one, to watch him in the shower. And I fought with this volley of no's, which he ignored, and he kept coming back at me with all this other stuff. And finally, I just said, when I win an Oscar in one of your movies, okay? And he was like, yeah, when you get nominated. I said, no, when I win an Oscar, and then I just fled, and then I just fled. Am I proud of that? The, I'm of two minds. The part that shames myself says no. The part of me that understands the way shame works says that was absolutely brilliant. Good job, kid. You got out of there. Well done. We all do the best we can, and our best is good enough. And it's really okay to have responded however we responded. A message for women across the country, some of whom sent us audio tapes. We promised not to reveal their names. I have no face in this. I have no name. You know nothing about me, but I'm still scared and I can't lose my job. We're doing this for her. You know, if this isn't her moment yet, we're helping create the moment when she can. And we had a question for this Hollywood star who says her belief in God is central in her life. What would you say to Harvey Weinstein today? A surprising answer. She says she'll never forgive what he did to women, but there's something else she must do because of her deep faith. You know, and what I would say to Harvey is, I love you and I understand that you are sick and suffering. And there is help for a guy like you too. And it's entirely up to you to get that help. That was an unexpected answer from Ashley. In the meantime, what's really staggering is the number of women across this country who've now reached out to you, Diane. Millions and millions and millions of women are speaking out. And I think Ashley Judd, all the women who've spoken out so far are asking, can we make this moment matter somehow? And so I wanted to be here to say to all of them, sending us the tapes and sending us the emails, we'll be here. We are not stopping on the story. Diane Sawyer with us. Diane, thank you. And there was one more headline today about alleged sexual harassment in the workplace. There are reports five women have now accused political analyst Mark Halperin of sexual harassment when he was the political director 
here at ABC more than 10 years ago. The women telling their stories about the incidents to CNN, from meetings in his office to the campaign trail and a hotel room. Mark Halpern has denied inappropriate touching, but he apologized in a statement saying, during this period, I did pursue relationships with women that I worked with, including some junior to me. I now understand from these accounts that my behavior was inappropriate and caused others pain. For that, I am deeply sorry and I apologize. ABC News responding in a statement, Mark left ABC News over a decade ago and no complaints were filed during his tenure. And most recently, Halpern has been an analyst for MSNBC. NBC News saying tonight in a statement that Halpern is leaving his role as a contributor until questions around his past conduct are fully understood. And tonight, HBO has now dropped plans for a miniseries based on a book being written by Mark Halpern and John Heilman on the 2016 election. There is still much more ahead on World News tonight this Thursday. The lawyer killed on his front porch in the urgent manhunt tonight. The lawyer gunned down in Kansas City, Missouri, and there is late word of a possible link to a recent case involving the lawyer. Here's ABC's Alex Perez. Tonight, Kansas City investigators hunting for the cold-blooded killer who gunned down attorney Tom Pickard. The husband was shot in the front yard. His wife discovering his body after he returned from dropping his two sons off at school. Find someone that you can trust. Picker was a successful personal injury attorney and had recently won a $5.75 million civil lawsuit against Kansas City businessman David Youngerman. Youngerman had shot two men but claimed they broke into his warehouse. He spoke to our station KMBC in January. They charged at me, put me in fear for my life. I had no choice but to shoot him. Police will not comment on whether Youngerman is under investigation. Police have recovered this white van, allegedly heard speeding away after Pickert was shot. It is registered to Youngerman. We know who the owner of the van is, and we've talked to him. David, investigators say Youngerman is not a suspect at this time. But police believe this was a targeted shooting and say there is no danger to the public. David? Alex Perez with us tonight. Thanks, Alex. When we come back, the major storm moving into the Northeast and the rescue at sea five months lost on the ocean and what you're about to see on this boat. Even the dogs extremely excited at the sight of their rescue. Threat tonight, our weather team tracking a deep freeze in the Midwest, whiteout conditions in Minnesota, the system moving east. And that major system threatening the east coast, heavy rain, wind gusts, and possible flooding tracking northeast through Sunday. And the rescue at sea tonight, two sailors and their dogs, and a huge sigh of relief. Lost in the Pacific for five months, traveling from Honolulu to Tahiti, they were picked up by a U.S. Navy ship about 5,000 miles from their